Hi, I'm Dave Miklos. Welcome to the third episode of the series, What DNA Says About Our Human Family. In the first episodes, we looked at the deep history and evolution of human beings. And today we're gonna to look at more recent changes in populations of human beings. And we're gonna do that by looking at an ALU insertion polymorphism or a DNA insertion into one of our chromosomes. episodes, we looked at DNA from one compartment of our cells, these things called mitochondria, which are the energy plants of cells. And we learned that they have very small chromosomes that are inherited only from our mothers, and that we can look at individual changes in the DNA ladder between any two humans, and we can use that to compare individuals. So these are point mutations that affect a single rung of the DNA ladder. Today, we're gonna to look at an insertion of DNA that comes from a DNA transposon or jumping gene. In this figure, we show the ALU, tra ALU transposon moves into a gene called CMYK, resulting in a disruption of that gene. And this particular ALU insertion is one of the things that is responsible for types of neurofibromatosis. So some ALU jumps into genes cause human diseases, but in fact, most ALU jumps are innocuous or have no effect on how or how we feel. I wanna remind you that the whole idea that move around from one place to another was discovered here at Cold Spring Harbor by Barbara McClintock in the 1950s. She went on to win a Nobel Prize for this in 1983. So let's come back to our model of an animal cell. Let's focus on the nucleus here, where the majority of our chromosomes, DNA, and genes reside. Here's the little mitochondrial chromosome that we studied before. And then these are the main chromosomes that are inherited both from our mothers and fathers, we're gonna focus in on chromosome 16. And remember that one of these chromosome 16s is inherited from our mother and one from our father. We need to take a look back at simple genetics that we may have learned in high school or even middle school to get an understanding of the ALU transposon or jumping gene and how it is inherited. It's a classic trait that's studied by just about everyone in school, and it's the trait of human eye color. We see a big variety of eyes between different human beings. And in fact, the idea that that is genetically determined was figured out here at Cold Spring Harbor by Charles Davenport in about 1908. What Davenport found is that there are sort of two versions of the eye color gene, and we call each of them an allele. There is a big B allele, which is dominant over a smaller B allele. And let's see how this works and refresh our memory about human inheritance. So if we have a mother, she creates eggs and each egg has one or the other allele. And she is, has one copy of each. The father also has one copy of each allele. And when he forms sperms, each of them will have one or the other of the alleles. Now, when a sperm and an egg come together, different combinations of the eye color alleles come together to make a genotype. Here's big, 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 big B. Big B, little B, big B, little B, and two little Bs. Those different genotype combinations determine the phenotypes or traits that we associate with eye color. These three genotypes, which all have at least one big B, determine brown eyes. And this genotype that has two small Bs determines blue eyes. Now, in fact, eye color is more complicated than just gene in action, but this gets across the basic idea that dark eyes are dominant over light colored eyes this human ALU insertion on chromosome 16, 
we need to sort of forget about a lot that we learned about classical genetics. Because first off, ALU really isn't a gene. It doesn't really make anything. It doesn't determine any trait like eye colors. So there's no phenotype or trait. There are two alleles in this system. There's a plus allele, which is the ALU inserted at this position on chromosome 16. And there's a minus allele, which is no insertion. The genetics work the same though. You can ima imagine a mother who has one copy of the insertion and one not. The father is the same. They create eggs and sperm that have one copy of the plus allele and one copy of the minus allele. When they com combine at fertilization of the egg, you come up with different genotypes, plus plus, plus minus, plus minus, and minus minus. So a simple genetic system. It's sort of like where the light switch can be either in an on or an off position. And in this case, there's two switches operating at the same time. I'm not going to do the experimental part here, but it's very easy to get DNA to do this ALU analysis at, on chromosome 16. First, we can isolate some DNA from cheek cells by rinsing our out, mouths out with saline solution or by using a swab. By that method, we obtain some squamous epithelial cells that line our mouth. We can lyse those or break those cells open. DNA spills out. And then we can amplify a region of chromosome 16 that we want to analyze using the method called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Again, we're not doing any of that. We really want to focus on the results of an experiment like this. Well, let's take a clo close look at this ALU insertion. And it's called by another name, PV92. Locus means a position on chromosome 16. So let's look at the two alleles. First off, here's an allele with nothing there. And here's, that's the minus allele. And here's the plus allele where the ALU has inserted. Remember, at one time long ago in history, we'll talk about it later on, all human DNA looked like this. And at one point in history, one ALU jumped into the human population and then spread through the kind of mating that I showed you on the previous slides. Okay? Now, if we amplify or enrich a region between what's called the left primer and the right primer, we can end up with a relatively long piece of DNA between those left and right primers. That includes the ALU, or a relatively short piece of DNA that's amplified between the left and the right primer which is the minus allele. So plus allele, minus allele. We can separate those alleles by size using agar electrophoresis. Um, I don't know if we can just take a quick look at this. This is uh, an agar gel electrophoresis chamber, and this is the way we separate DNA by size. DNA has a, a, a negative charge, so we can separate it by size in the electric field if we simply connect these electrodes to a power source. Now, let's look at the results of an experiment. And in this experiment, there's one, two, three, four, five, six individuals from which we've extracted DNA by a saline mouthwash. And let's see what we see here. Let's start with the simplest one. And that one is here. Here we see one band of DNA that's 731 base pairs or rungs of the DNA ladder long. That is the insertion allele. Here's another allele of 416 base pairs or rungs of the DNA ladder. And that shorter allele is the minus allele. So here is the position of the plus allele. Here is the position of the minus allele. Now we can look and score or rate all of the other experiments. Next to it, we see only one band in the position of the minus allele. So this person has the genotype minus minus. This person had the genotype of plus minus. Let's come over here to this lane or this person. 
we see one band in the upper position that is a plus allele. So this person has two copies of the plus allele and is plus plus, minus minus, minus minus, plus plus. So it's very easy to do group people, extract DNA from their mouths, amplify it by PCR, and then score their genotypes as I just showed you briefly here. Well, once we have those data from us, we can then use bioinformatics to analyze the characteristics of different groups or of students or other people who have done this experiment. So I'm gonna move now to an online analysis tool that we used before called Bioservers. I have the Bioservers template up on my desktop. I already started to populate it with data just so that I wouldn't forget where I would find it. But as we did with Sequence Server, we collect data from this part of the tool, we move cases here into the workspace, and then we analyze them. Let me just show you that here are some classes that have done this experiment relatively recently. I already selected a class from Tulsa, Oklahoma that did this experiment just uh, a day or two ago. A class in New York who did this experiment recently. And a class here, which was in Germany. So just for starters, I selected those and I moved them into the work workplace. And I also collected this from, an, from about a year ago. And this is a class of students from high school, Beijing High School 166, which is in China. So how would we now look at the analysis of these classes? Let's just go into this class from Oklahoma and just open up the file. And what we see is that 16 students did this experiment and here is the score or the genotype of each of those 16 students. Now, we can easily calculate how many plus plus genotypes there are. This is a percentage, 12%. The plus minus genotype is 19%. And the minus minus genotype is 69% in this group of 16 students. Now, let me show you how to look at this visually I'm gonna pull up another class and compare it. This is the class from New York. So I'm just gonna compare them. And what we see is the genotype distribution of these two classes. And we made them like a pie chart. So here's the class we started with initially. Remember I told you that 69% of the students had the minus minus genotype. 19% have the plus minus genotype and 12% are plus plus. The group from New York looks relatively similar because you'll see that the largest proportion of the students have the minus minus genotype. I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see it better. There we go. So in both classes, the minus minus genotype is predominant and the plus minus genotype is secondary followed by the plus plus. Now, in fact, many times in population genetics, we really just only look at the, of the plus or the minus allele. We, we add up all of the minus alleles here and the minus alleles from here, plus alleles from here and these from here. And we can get a much simpler view of this, which is a view of the allele frequencies. So in these two groups or populations, the minus allele predominates about three quarters of the time, and the plus allele is present in roughly one fourth of the students. So that gives you a sort of a snapshot of these two student classes one from Oklahoma in the United States, from New York. And they actually look pretty similar. 
I say pretty similar because if we look at some other classes, we might see something different. Compare the class from Oklahoma to the class from Germany. Here's the Oklahoma class, and here's the class from Germany. Again, really rather similar, with the minus allele being found 75% of the time, roughly, and the plus allele being found 25% of the time, more or less. Well, I pulled up this, I specifically brought the class from Beijing here so that you could see students from the other side of the world, and what do they look like when we compare them, when we can compare, compare the class of students from Beijing to the class of students from Oklahoma. And let's take a look at that. Now, you don't need to be a stat statistician to see that these two groups or populations of students are radically different in their allele frequencies. Whereas in the group from New York, the vast majority of the students had minus alleles, or the population had predominantly minus alleles. In the group from Beijing 166 High School, the plus allele is dominant. The question is, is this just luck of some experiments, or can we reproduce this between populations around the world? The way we could go and look at all the different students who did the experiment from different places, and we would get somewhat of a representation of the world. But an easier way is now to go to a database and collect samples from a database. The key thing about doing this experiment with yourself or with a class of other people is you see how do we actually collect the data and how do we move from a bunch of people sitting in a classroom to this description of the population at this one genetic place on chromosome. Remember, we're only looking at one place on one chromosome. So it's sort of a snapshot of a little tiny piece of your genetic material, of all of, all of it. Well, let's go into the database here. I'm gonna to have to zoom out in order to find it here, but that's fine. So let's come into a database of reference populations. These are experiments that have been done by scientists all around the world in this, using pretty much the same methods that we use with classes. Uh, I'll zoom in a little bit so that you can see them now. And what we have here is the same experiment performed with groups of people from around the world. And really, you can call these different populations of people. I'm going to select a few of them to try to represent the old world, which is Africa, Asia, and Europe, and the new world, which are the Americas. Okay, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on the old world. Here I'm going to take a sample of the Kung Bushmen, who are used to be hunter, hunter and gatherers until very recently. I'm going to take an, an Aborigine from Australia. I'll take an Alaskan native. I'll take another Chinese sample. I'll take a Philippine, Filipino sample, a French. We already have a German one, so I'll think that's fine. We'll take uh, an Indian Christian, an Indian his, Hindu, and an is, Indian Muslim. Um, we'll take a Nigerian from West Africa, a Pakistani, Papua New Guinea, a pygmy from the central part of Africa, A Swiss, a Southern Indian, a Turkish, and a native population from the Amazon, the Yanomamos. 
So let's just see if I've got a pretty good representation. Let's also take the Mayans from um, Central America and let's take the Malays from near to Indonesia. And I think that's plenty of populations to work with, at least now. Um, yes. So let's move them into the workspace. Let's expand this workspace view here. And let's start doing some comparisons between initially our class in Oklahoma, because again, the idea is if you do this, start with your own data, analyze it a bit, and then compare your data to other groups, and then you move entirely to the other groups. So let's start with the group from Oklahoma. Let's compare it to the uh, Chinese. Uh, I'm sorry, to the, um, we already did that. Let's compare them to the Kung Bushmen. Now I'm gonna actually write down the results, and you can do this with me. I suppose there's some easier way, but this is the only way I know how to do it. I'm gonna write down some of the results that we've, we've obtained so far. So, the Kung Bushmen versus the Oklahoma group. And they look surprisingly similar. So the Oklahoma group, by the way, was, I'm just gonna write down the plus allele frequency. That's the added um, ALU insertion. So 22%. And look, the Kung Bush, Bushman is almost identical at 20%. Okay, let's make another comparison between the Oklahoma class and let's just see if the Chinese are similar to the Chinese class that we did previously. And in fact, the plus allele frequency is even a little higher among this Chinese group here. It's 86% of the insertion allele. Let's branch out and let's try the Chinese versus the Filipinos. And you'll see that they look sort of similar with the plus allele being the dominant one and the Filipinos are 12, or sorry, 80%. I'm looking at this number of the plus allele. Now I could do the comparisons over and over, but another simple way is I can now just open up some of these populations and simply write down some of the allele frequencies. So let's just open up the French group and look at their allele frequency. The plus allele frequency is 23. Let's look at the Indian Christians. The plus allele frequency is 48. The Malays, sorry, the Malays are 72. Now I don't know if you're seeing any sort of the pattern, but we're gonna put some of these on the map and maybe it will become more apparent to, apparent to you. Let's take the pygmies from Central Africa. Twenty six percent. The Pakistanis. Thirty percent. The Mayans of Central America, sorry, wrong one. Seventy percent. The Alaskan natives, twenty-eight. 
29%. The Nigerians from West Africa, 9%. And remember, I'm just looking at this plus allele frequency here. And maybe just like one or two more. Let's take the Turkish. Fifty-eight percent. And let's just do one more, and I think we'll have the world reasonably well covered. Uh, let's take the Yana, Yanamamo from the Amazon Rainforest, 96%. Okay. I think we have enough to sort of tell a story. Oh, let's just do one more here. Um, let's just make sure that we add in... a Hindu Indian. Fifty-two percent. Okay, I've written down a few of these. Oh, and I just want to remember what the German group was that we did earlier. I forgot. That's uh, the introns. Twenty-five percent. Great. So Let's go to the board now and put some of these onto a map and see if we can see any kind of pattern. Uh, these are all the populations we could possibly look at, but let's make the map a little bit simpler because I know where these places are. And let's just simply write in some of these allele frequencies on the map. Remember, we started out here in Oklahoma. And that was 22%. That's the allele frequency of the plus allele. We looked at the Kung Bushmen of Africa, Southern Africa, were 20%. We looked at the Chinese, who were 86%. And the Beijing group was a little less. I think it was 76%. The Philippines were 80%. The French were 23%. Whoop, I don't want to move this too much. The Indian Christians were, I don't know exactly where they would be, but 48%. The Malays were 72%. The pygmies from Central Africa were 26%. The Pakistanis were 30%. Germany was 25%. The Mayans, 70%. The Alaskan natives, 29%, Nigeria, 9%, Turkey, 58%, the Yanomamos of Central Amazon, 96 the Indian Christians, 56 Now, we could add more and more onto this. But if you cross your eyes and sort of look at this and act as if this were a weather map and these were temperatures or barometric pressure, you could sort of make a, a map that looks like this. With the highest allele frequencies being in Asia, intermediate allele frequencies being in India and uh, the Near East, lower frequencies in Europe, Africa, and the United States, with the exception of here. 
So let's sort of exclude the new world for now, and let's think about the old world, because remember, that's where populations have lived the longest time. So now I pose the question to you, where did the original Alu jump occur? Because all of the theory and everything we know about how jumping genes or transposons behave is that there was one event that happened at this position on chromosome 16. One person received that Alu jump, and then that person bred with other people, and then it spread in some way to other people around the world. But the question is, where did the original jump occur? Now, if you look at this map, as I once did, and as most people do, you'll you might come up with a hypothesis, something like this, which is perhaps the Alu jump occurred in Asia, the original one, bred among the populations in Asia, and then spread to the other populations more or less like this. Let's not even worry about these right here. So one hypothesis is that this Alu jump may have occurred in Asia and then sort of spread by a mechanism that we call gene flow, which is genes moving between adjacent populations so that you get something like this. And it sort of is diluted as you move from east to west. Well, that's a pretty good idea. But let me show you one problem maybe with that idea. We're just switching back to the other source here. coming back into my presentation here. So I asked the question, where did the ALU at, at the position PV92 on chromosome 16, where did it make that jump? Now, we've made a hypothesis that perhaps the jump occurred in Asia, the initial jump. Now, I need to tell you something about the timing of that jump. It's very difficult to determine when this alu made the jump into an ancient human. But it's believed that it was about 200,000 years ago. Maybe less, maybe 100,000. Let's say between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, the original alu at this position jumped into one person. Now, let's think about it. We had this, we have a theory of human evolution that says that Homo erectus came out of Africa and then evolved into modern humans in Asia, Europe, and Africa. That's called the multi-regional hypothesis. So let's stop and think. And then the other hypothesis is Homo erectus came out of Africa a long time ago, over a million years ago, but a second group, oh, maybe I don't have the right animation here. Let me advance. Let's see if I have the right one or not. So here's the second theory. Homo erectus in red came out of Africa about a million years ago, but a second recent group came out of Africa about 60,000 years ago and populated the world. That's called the recent African origin or out of Africa theory. Now, in fact, we said in the last installment that the DNA evidence mainly supports this recent African origin. In other words, that modern humans originated in Africa and left there only recently, within the last, say, 60 or 80,000 years. So if we say that Alu jumped in Asia, Alu would have had to jump into a Homo erectus in Asia 200,000 years ago, because those were the hominids that we know were living in Asia at the time. And that Homo erectus into which that jump 
occurred would have had to survive and become modern humans or interbreed with modern humans to pass that on. But we know from archaeology and anthropology, other DNA studies, that Homo erectus went extinct in Asia well before European, uh, the modern humans came there. So saying that Alu jumped 200,000 years ago into some hominin in Asian forces you to say, oh, well, the multi-regional development hypothesis might be correct because that Alu jump has carried forward and it happened in Homo erectus. But the question is, is can we make these data, well, can we make the data, we'll look at them again, can we make them uh, fit the recent origin in African in Africa idea, and the thing is we can, but we do one more experiment. So in order to do the next experiment, we need to think about how people 100,000 or 200,000 years ago when this Alu jump occurred. And let's now presume that that jump actually happened in Africa so that this would be consistent with the recent African origin of modern humans. So how were people living 100,000, 200,000 years ago? They were living in small groups or bands, like Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert lived up until about 50 years ago. They lived as hunter-gatherer groups. And the only occupation for a human being at that time 200,000 years ago was to be a hunter-gatherer. Now, let's also think about how that alu insertion spread. I represent that original event 200,000 years ago with this kaboom in red. So one person, let's just say a man, ended up with one plus allele. It was the only plus allele in the world at that position among ancient humans. He would mate with a woman. She would have to be minus minus because there were no other plus alleles around. But you can see that in the first generation, you would give rise to children that had one plus allele and one minus allele, just in the first generation. And then imagine that after some period of time, a woman with one plus allele met with a man with one plus allele. And then you begin to see people that have two plus alleles. So you can see that just by regular that a new event like an alu jump on chromosome 16 can spread around a population. So what I want to do now is to go to a utility that will let us simulate what may have happened with the alu jump in ancient populations. So I'm going to now Go to a new website. It's part of the BioServers suite. We use Sequence Server. Today we used Allele Server. And today we're going to use a new one called Simulation Server. It'll take a moment to get the hang of this, but it's really quite simple. So what we're going to simulate... Okay, I've been asked to zoom a little bit. Okay, so what we're going to simulate here is that alu jump into a population of ancient hominids 200,000 years ago. Now you have to ask yourself, what size of a group or a population that would support hunting, hunting and gathering? It wouldn't be 1,000 people. It wouldn't probably even be 500 people. It would be some number less than 100 would be in that hunter-gatherer group. Let's just for argument's sake, say 50, that there was a hunter-gatherer groups of more or less 50 people into which this alu jump occurred. Now, if there's 50 individuals, remember each individual 
chromosome 16s. So if you have 50 people, there are 100 alleles, okay? And if an alley jumps into one person, one allele, the percentage of alu at the beginning of the experiment, the allele frequency is 1%, one chromosome out of a total 100 chromosomes. So in the start of my simulation, percent of the alu plus allele will be one. I'm gonna run this for 100 generations, in other words, 100 matings. I'm gonna have a starting population of 50, that's the hunter-gatherer group. Now I could run this experiment one time, but the great thing about computers is you can run a simulation many, many times. So what I'm gonna do is actually 100 experiments. Now those 100 experiments could be 100 to different places, but the better way to think about it is imagine that there's 100 different human populations, each one of 50 that would only be 5,000 people. Now, in fact, there were times in the evolution of humans when that might have been the whole size of the whole population of humans around, let's say, in Africa. So anyway, let, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have 100 different populations that get a new alu jump. We're gonna run, let them breed for 100 generations using a matrix, using a computer matrix and program that will look just like the little uh, Hardy wine, uh, just like the little Punnett squares that we did previously. And the key thing is, we have we do, we do not believe that the alu on chromosome 16 has any advantage to survival. Does it make you more fit? And by the same token, it doesn't. So we're going to say that all of the three genotypes are equally fit. In other words, there's no disadvantage to being a plus 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 minus or minus minus. That's called neutral evolution. So we're gonna set these values and we're gonna run the simulation. I think it's having trouble with the zoom here, so I'm gonna zoom back out. So I'm going to set the values and run the simulator. Oh. What? Well, I don't think that's, let's see if that's, maybe that didn't, it didn't like that. No, I think it's the Zoom. What? Where? All right, okay, so let's try it again. So I've set these values, 100 populations, each with one new alu jump, 1% of the alleles, 100 generations, population size 50 in a hunter-gatherer group, set the values, and it's not working. So let me just reload this. It was working, so um, hopefully it's going to work. Let's try again. Enter 1%, uh, 100 populations, 100 runs, starting allele frequency of 1%, one alu jump in 50 people. Well, Oh, sorry, you know, <laughs> this is what happens when you do things in front of people. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the key thing. I've used this a million times, I forgot the key thing, so uh, camera shot. First off, I have to start with a population, <laughs> so there it is. I'm gonna actually do 100 iterations of this experiment, starting allele frequency 1%, 100 generations, 
starting population of 50. There's the hunter-gatherer group. Sorry, I forgot to put the note on there. And now let's run the simulation. Sorry, there was an extra thing there. Okay, now it's running. Now, here's what I want you to see. So each one of these lines represents one population beginning with a 1% allele frequency. These are the number of generations going this way, and this is the allele frequency of the plus allele. And what you'll see is that after 100 generations, only two populations have preserved the alu allele at all. One preserved it at about 52% and one preserved it at 62% uh, and one at 58%. But all the rest of the 98 populations, the alu jump was bred out of the population just by random mating. Now you can try this again and run the simulation again. So it's another 100 tries and we see a little bit different, which is, again, generations, 100, allele frequency. We start out at one. Most of the populations lose the alu, but three, three populations preserve it at the end. And I'm going to do one final thing. And look at the, the allele frequency here in this population is nearly 100%. This one is 78%, and this one's quite low, like uh, 5 or 10 I'm just going to do it one more time and see what happens. One population made it through with the alu after 100 generations. I'm looking for one thing. You're, when I see it, I should get it this time, I hope. No. being difficult with me, but I'm going to try one more time and see if I get what I'm looking for. Well, I didn't, didn't get it, but let's just leave this this way. So what you'll see is that if we try to follow one of these, here's one population, and what you'll see, the allele frequency is changing dramatically from generation to generation, going up and down and all around, and then it ends up here at 70%. This random fluctuation is called genetic drift. In small populations, subject to random mating, and with that random mating, if I can't look at you and say you're a plus plus or a plus minus, I can't tell what your genotype is, then the mating is truly random and the, the frequency of the allele fluctuates over time. So here's one population with, here's one population with 65, here's one with 40, and here's a couple with less than 10. The point that I wanna make here is that you can explain the variation in allele frequencies of PV92 alu just by genetic drift. We're going to return to that in just a second, but I'm going to do one more quick experiment here, which is I'm going to put another node on here. Okay? And this node, what I'm going to do is have the population... We're going to do 100 runs. The population is going to get big. It wouldn't happen overnight, but it's going to grow to 5,000 in this one. Remember, this one is the hunter-gatherer group, and then this is going to be a big population representing sort of a town, although it doesn't happen immediately. And I'm going to link these two together. 
So I'm gonna program this node. It will receive whatever is left over after these 100 generations. The first 100 generations will be our hunter-gatherer group. And then if any of the populations have the ALU insertion after 100 generations, they'll feed it into the next part of the simulation. So let's run the simulation. Oh, this doesn't, this didn't go in. Let me see, it didn't go in right. The uh, population didn't change here for some reason. I could tell by the results. So that's 5,000 is gonna be the second population. Let me program that node. And the first one, Let's just try again. Here's the starting one that we did before, 100 runs, 1% 1 population, uh, allele frequency, 50 individuals. Here's the second one, the big population, 5,000. And now let's link one to two. Let's just double check that they look right. Population of 50. 100 generations, population of 5,000, 100 generations. That looks good. Just make sure the values are in here and we'll run the simulation. Now, what you'll see is something totally different. Here's the first 100 generations here and here's the second set, it should be 100 and 200, up to 200. But anyway, here's the second set. Under these conditions was a small, small population of hunter-gatherers. You'll see that most of the jumps were lost, but four populations had the alu allele at the end of 100 generations. Then the population grew, and look what happens to the graph in the large population, is the allele frequency becomes relatively stable and that's called equilibrium. This is genetic drift, and this is equilibrium. So let's go back to the map that we created and make a plausible idea about why populations look the way they do today with ALU. So let's try to make this consistent with human beings originating in Africa and coming out of Africa about 60,000 years. So just imagine Africa, the allele frequencies were drifting, but the populations were getting big enough to a little bit. But some of these people left and started to migrate into Asia and up into Europe. And these migrations were not huge numbers of people, but they were hunter-gatherer bands of 50 or so people. So let's just say that the frequency in Africa before these people left was about 25 or 30 percent, just for argument's sake. But then as they went out, these small bands would be drifting, 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 drifting upwards, and then as the population stabilized in this area, gave rise to groups that had relatively intermediate values. As the populations then got bigger, the allele, allele frequency stabilized at this sort of intermediate level. And the groups of hunter-gatherers that came out to Asia, the allele frequency was drifting. We happened to have founders of these populations that had very high allele frequencies. The populations grew and then stabilized these relatively high allele frequencies. That also explains these very, these very high allele frequencies here in these small groups of essentially hunter-gatherers here and then a small, uh, smaller populations initially here. There was drift at work that let these allele frequencies drift very high, just as they had in Asia. So 
What we see with Alu is the effects of population movements out of Africa combined <coughs> with genetic drift that changed the allele frequencies. We're nearly out of time, so I'm just going to show you one final sort of thought experiment. Uh, I spent some time in Sardinia 20 or 30 years ago, and I met this man, Marcello Siniscalco, who is a population geneticist. He had worked in the 1960s in um, India with J.B.S. Haldane, who was one of the most famous population geneticists of all time. But Marcello Siniscalco spent most of his life looking at populations of people on the island of Sardinia in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Now what you need to know about Sardinia is that it had a very ancient population of Bronze Age people that built thousands of these stone structures and these complicated dwellings. So there was a rich culture on Sardinia well before the civilizations that we know of, such as the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And as a matter of fact, after this original culture was founded on Sardinia, Sardinia was successively colonized by seagoing people, the Babylonians, the Carthaginians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And then everybody went away from that island and it became a backwater. And the genes that had been left there just percolated and were traded. My friend Marcello did this alu experiment in some of the towns of Sardinia. And here's two of them that are in the central mountain massif of Sardinia, Olalai and Arizzo. And if you look at them, they're separated one from another by relatively high mountains. And these villages are just barely in genetic equilibrium. You know, there are a few thousand people. But you can imagine when these villages were founded, they were a very small group of people founded each one of these villages. And what you need to know is that up until the Second World War, if you were born in the village of Arizzo, you lived in Arizzo your whole life, you probably married someone from Arizzo, and you died in Arizzo. And even if you went off to the Second World War, you probably came back and married within this group. So these are isolated populations separated by geography, these mountains. And what we found is that if you look at the Alu plus allele frequency in these two towns, the village of Arizzo looks pretty much like we've seen in Europeans, which is an allele frequency of near to 20%. That's pretty much what we see in Europe. But look at the group from Olalai. There are no plus alleles at all in that population. It's the only, one of only several populations that have been looked at anywhere that have no plus alleles. And you say to yourself, how could that be? And as a matter of fact, this population of Olalai is just as distant from the Italian mainland as they are from this town, Arizzo. And how far separate are the towns of Arizzo and Olalai? It's 51 kilometers or 30 miles distance between these two towns. But genetically, in this system, they might as well be a thousand miles apart. Now, these populations aren't the same in every genetic system, but I just wanted to show you that the effects of genetic drift, two populations, even living rather close to each other, look totally different because the mechanism of genetic drift is a random operation going on. And there's this story. 
The final story I want to tell you is about two revolutions that occurred in Europe and the genetic thing by those revolutions. So in a snapshot, if you look at uh, hundreds of thousands of places on the chromosomes using modern technology, okay, so this is different than the technology we've talked about. You can take all of those hundreds of thousands of point mutations for each person sort them down into about 10 sort of groups. And then you can make a pie chart of those 10 different population elements within people that you type in Europe. And you this with remains from ancient graves. So we have plenty of sort of ancient bones that were dug up in this period, which was called the Old Stone Age, the Paleolithic. And what you see in Europe and Western Asia at that time is three distinct, distinct groups. And the pie charts are very similar to the pie chart, charts I showed you for Alu. Alu, you can see that in Western Europe was a group of hunter-gatherers who had this predominantly red genotype. There were farmers that were beginning to farm in Turkey and the Fertile Crescent that had this genotype that was predominantly gold or yellow. And you had another group of hunter-gatherers out in Western, um, what is now Western Russia, who had this predominantly green genotype. If you now look at skeletons from graves coming forward in time, about 4,000 years ago, what you see is that the yellow genotype that originated in the Middle East has now mixed in Europe and become pretty much predominant. And that is the fingerprint of agriculturalists coming out of Central Asia, bringing the technology of farming to, to villages and towns of Europe, mingling their genes and in some case, displacing even the populations that were in Europe. Now, this, that was the first revolution, the agricultural revolution that swept across Europe uh, from about 8,000 years ago up until about 2,000 years ago. But the second incursion, the second revolution, came from this red group. And if you remember these red group, they were originally hunter-gatherers but they were the people who also domesticated the horse in the steppes of Central Asia. They were called the Yamnaya. They had this predominantly red genotype. And beginning about 2,000 years ago, the horse people from the steppes of Asia swept across Europe and brought their genes and the culture of using horses for transport and agriculture into Europe. And now you see the imprint of the red coming in of people from cemeteries in this time. And this is what you see of modern people in Europe is a pretty much mixture of the original hunter-gatherers, the farmers, and the Yamnaya horsemen are found pretty much in a mixture throughout Asia. So I hope what you do this three-part series some parts were clear and some parts were unclear, is that we can learn a lot about where humans came from and how they moved to populate this globe by looking at DNA. And we can even do several simple experiments with you to look at your own DNA and to put yourself into this picture. So I hope that you'll continue on with looking at human evolution and human migrations in terms of DNA because there's so many riddles that we can uncover. Thank you for joining me in this three-part series. Dave Nicholas from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory.